Hello YouTube people! I don't know what issue, episode number, sorry, this is. I can count actually, six. I think this is number 11, and we are officially on to my third bookcase. This is like a little bookcase, it's equivalent to like three of the shelves there basically. And it's through my bedroom, so uh, yeah, that we'll get through that one quickly. And then I've got some tall thin ones, and then three more massive ones. We're getting there anyway, that's all we need to know. We're up to G by author surname, and so without further ado, let's go. So first up we have The Mask of Time by Marius Gabriel. And this, yeah, this is what I remember it as being. It's like, it's, it's an erotic thriller basically. So it's not just like erotica um, in terms of, I mean, it does have erotica in it and like lots of very graphic sex scenes, but it's also very much a thriller. Like it's about like international espionage and stuff. I remember this one part in it, if this is the book I'm thinking of at least, where like, I'm pretty sure it is the book I'm thinking of, where they, the, the spies captured like the head of the foreign spy agency. And then they basically like, this is going to get graphic. <laughs> they basically put a up, up his and filmed it so that they could blackmail him with it. So that was a scene in this book. I mean, thinking about it now, I'm like, this, this raises all sorts of questionable issues. But I do remember enjoying this book. Like, as it is, I don't read much stuff with, like, proper erotic content in. But this is one of the ones I remember thinking it seemed to be done pretty well. Oh, door. I got a book in the post. Okay, anyway, next book. Speaking of Latvia, we have Inga Gale, 30 questions people don't ask. And I went to the book launch of this in Riga in Latvia. It's poetry, it's written in both Latvian and in English. Here is a little sign bit there. It says, For Dane, thanks for coming. Inga, the 9th of the 3rd, 2018. And uh, I will read you a little tiny bit of one of the poems. I'm not going to read you a whole poem. Actually... No, yeah, let's just read you this little bit, this poem. All right, Damascus Autumn. Damascus... Oh, what's happened? I need to sit up here. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention to my framing there. Damascus Autumn has arrived in our land. Many of us will never be able to inhale the air that flutters round the bodies of birds in the bright blue sky over the foliage gold. We want to leave the house and go to the alley. We dreamt about it all these years when we didn't know each other. Not even to find the house at the end of the lane, simply to reach the green shade and walk hand in hand through the alley, the one that used to lead to the house. I remember the quiet girl in the green meadow, and I understand, she knew it already then, the Damascus autumn has arrived, the time when we are unable to be, only able to be quiet, to stare at burning maples and see the world, how painfully beautiful it is in the days before we die. All right, next up we have American Gods 2. American Gods 5 and American Gods 8 by Neil Gaiman, P. Craig Russell, Scott Hampton, Glenn Fabry. And these are the like graphic novel editions or whatever you would call them, the comics, are they? Yeah, well, they're Dark Horse comics, actually, I think it publishes them. Yeah, and so these are like the adaptations of American Gods. And uh, I got these all pretty cheap in a comic shop while we were on holiday. Unfortunately, I didn't think they were very good. Uh, I, I enjoyed American Gods. I know a lot of people didn't necessarily enjoy it. I mean, I find Neil Gaiman pretty hit and miss in general. But American Gods was one of the ones that I did like. So, um, but the, the comic adaptation wasn't as good. So here is my copy of American Gods. What? Is weird about my edition I remember this from when I read it so look here we got page 610 it goes I don't know if you can see this I need to show you this because this is weird as fuck page 110 do you see that there uh, and look and see right 610 and we have here his author bio so that sentence just disappears right then we turn the page and we have the front bit including all of the copyright information and then the first 30 pages of the book again so I don't know I don't know whether that's a misprint or whether it's meant to be some sort of statement it really confused me when I read it I was like I don't know what's going on there anyway we also have Neil Gaiman Neverwhere I actually read this for a book club several years ago I only like participated in this club for one book which was this one it was with a blogger and I can't even remember who it was this is set under the streets of London 
Uh, I did quite enjoy Neverwhere. Neverwhere was alright. Then we have Stardust, which bored the pants off me. And I've not seen the movie, but after reading this, I don't want to see the movie. It was just, yeah. I don't want to talk about it, because if I talk about it, this video will get a dislike. I'm sorry, I don't necessarily like... <laughs> books, I guess. I don't know. I don't force myself to like them, I guess, is the, is the thing, isn't it? Okay, then we have uh, Robert Galbraith. So we have Career of Evil, The Cuckoo's Calling, and The Silkworm. These are obviously uh, J.K. Rowling under her pseudonym, and these are the Cormoran Strike books. I guess it does bother me slightly. I have two, two hardbacks and one paperback. I don't know. I just got whatever I could get them from, like, charity shops. They were all right. They were pretty bog standard for like crime novels, I thought, but I mean, I still read them. I'd read another one if it came out. Uh, I wouldn't rush to it, though. Okay, then we have Charlie Gallagher, Bodily Harm, a gripping crime thriller full of twists. Uh, and this is just one that I was sent, and I can't tell you a thing about it. I don't remember it. So that's, that's how good that one was. Then we have Steve Garfield Get Seen. This is uh, subtitled Online Video Secrets to Building Your Business. So this was part of a series I was reading, the New Rules of Social Media series. It's quite outdated now. I mean, I got it when I got into social media marketing in like 2012 or something like that. It was all right. I didn't enjoy it as much as uh, Kevin Nolte's book. And uh, he has a YouTube channel called Nolts where it's like his vlog channel for his family. But he has like 240,000 subscribers. So I was more interested in what Noltz had to say about video than about Steve Garfield. Okay, then we have Paul Gascoigne with Hunter Davis. Gaza, my story. So Gaza is an English footballer. He also had a lot of problem with alcohol addiction. He still does from what I understand. And that's his autobiography. And I don't know why, I think he's like a, he's a national treasure. Maybe less so now than in his heyday. But when I was growing up, he was like one of the big footballers that, you know, everyone kind of looked up to and everyone talked about. So, um, yeah, that's why I read it, really. Just interested. He's had quite the life, has Gaza. Okay, then we have Don't Panic, I'm Islamic. Uh, this is an anthology of kind of... It's like political fiction, I guess, really. Uh, words and pictures on how to stop worrying and learn to love the alien next door. Edited by Lynn Gaspard. And uh, this is another one I was sent a copy of, and I just had to say yes, just because it's so beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're interested, uh, let me read you the blurb. I think that's the best way to summarise it. I can't summarise it any, in any other way. How can you tell if your neighbour is speaking Muslim? Is a mosque a kind of hedgehog? Can I get fries with that burqa? You can't trust the media any longer, but there's no need to fret. Don't panic, I'm Islamic provides you with the answers. Read this book to learn how you too can spot an elusive Islamist. Discover how Ar Arabs, even 21-year-old largely innocuous and totally adorable ones, plant bombs and get tips about how to interact with Homeland Security, which may or may not involve funny discussions about your sexuality. I would recommend it was cool. Alright, then we have Tolkien's Gown and Other Stories of Great Authors and Rare Books by Rick Joukowsky. And I've had this for a while now, so Joukowsky is like uh, a rare book dealer basically, and he's also sort of dealt merchandise and that kind of stuff, and Tolkien's Gown was actually Tolkien's old university gown which he, he sold. But um, this was given to me by a guy who used to be in a band with my dad. He used to play bass guitar. And he got it for me because Graham Greene was there on the cover. And he knew that Graham Greene was an author I was really getting into at the time. So he gave me this book. And it's about how Joukowsky handled uh, some signed Graham Greene books. I think he actually sold them for Greene himself. Then we have William Gerhardy, The Polyglots. A friend of mine gave this to me. He's uh, Gerhardy is considered to be like a comic novelist. I remember it as being okay. To be honest, I can't really remember it enough to uh, to talk about it any more than that. But yeah, William Gerhardy, The Polyglots. Okay, then we have The Athena Doctrine by John Gertzheimer and Michael D'Antonio. It's kind of funny that it's uh, written by two men, really, but it's about how women and the men who think like them will rule the future. And I do kind of agree with it. They basically talk about what society has previously considered to be feminine traits. And... Um, 
relate that back to how we need that style of leadership. So if you think of more masculine traits, we're talking more about 1980s Wall Street, you know, everyone being an asshole, trying to one-up each other, all this kind of stuff, a lot of backstabbing. And Gutsema and D'Antonio in this basically just argue, you know, women have historically been more uh, cooperative than competitive, have, you know, been more about kindness than ruthlessness. And that's what we need for, uh, you know, future leadership and indeed the shape of our society. And I don't think you can argue with that general message. Whether the book is any good, yeah, it was all right. I mean, I didn't agree with everything they said, but I agreed with a fair amount of it. That's what we'll go for. All right, here we have William Gibson, Neuromancer. This is just sort of classic sci-fi. I uh, only read this two or three years ago, and I did quite enjoy it. I want to read more Gibson, and in fact, I have one of his books, Virtual Light, up there on my TBR. But um, yeah. I mean, if you're a sci-fi fan, you kind of need to read Gibson. But if you're not a sci-fi fan, you could probably get away with passing, you know. Then we have here two books by Isabel Thurston. And those are So You Think You Know Discworld and So You Think You Know His Dark Materials. So these are quiz books. Obviously, His Dark Materials is my favourite trilogy. And then Discworld is Terry Pratchett. Let's do a Discworld question. Which member of the elucidated brethren of the Ebon Knight is always sent out to get pizzas or other takeaway food? Both Brother Fingers, Watchtower, or Plasterer? I could not tell you. That's from Guards Guards as well, but... They are separated by book, actually, which is kind of cool. So you can kind of go in and quiz yourself on the book you've just read. And, uh, yeah, they're all right. They are what they are. They're pretty cheap. I don't know if they're still even in print, but I enjoyed them. Why not? All right, now we're on to my Allen Ginsberg collection. So here we have Cosmopolitan Greetings, poems 1980, 1986 to 1992. I mean, I enjoy Allen Ginsberg. We can assume that most of these are four star books, you know, at the very minimum. I'm not gonna read your poems out of all of them because we'll be here all day just reading Ginsberg, especially because his poems are quite long. But I am a pretty big uh, Ginsberg fan, as you will see from my little collection here. Here we have Howl and Other Poems. I think this is what I started with because I had to read this for a poetry module at university. We have the, uh, let, where's the opening line of Howl? I'll read you a bit of that. Because that Howl and the opening lines are very famous. It's super long though. I considered memorising it, but it's like 4,000 words or something. Anyway, Howl. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the negro streets at dawn looking for an angry fix, angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night, who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz. And then we continue. Here we have Kaddish and other poems, 1958 to 1960. Let's see which ones have we got in here. Uh, what about LSD, for example? Mind Breaths, poems, 1972 to 1977. This one actually has some music in it as well, which is quite cool. We have such poems as Sweet Boy, Gimme Your Ass. Had to be playing on the jukebox. Which uh, Rage Against the Machine set that one to music and, and performed it live and it sounded pretty cool. But yeah, Mind Breaths. Plutonian Ode and Other Poems, 1977 to 1980. Oh, you can't see that one. There we go. These are all published by City Lights, City Lights Books. The Fall of America, Poems of These States, 1965 to 1971. I would say if you're not going to get Howl and Other Poems, get The Fall of America. That was one of my favourites. Then we have The Letters of Allen Ginsberg. This one is a beast. This is one that I had to read bit by bit in my bed. And uh, yeah, I'm proud to say that I managed to read my way through that one. And that is it for Allen Ginsberg. So now we have Malcolm Gladwell, who writes non-fiction. So we have here Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. And then here we have The Tipping Point, How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference. And Gladwell is just one of those non-fiction writers who you know, you sh I think everyone should read one of his books at some point. Do you know what? I'm going to revise that statement slightly. I think everyone who's interested in business or who runs their own business should read Gladwell at least once. Also Dave Trott, who I've talked about recently because I've been reading some of his books. And also this chap here. So here we have Seth Godin. This is free prize inside. Remember when cereal came with a free prize inside? 
Even if you already liked the cereal, it was the free prize, something small yet precious, that made it irresistible. Here Seth Godin shows how you can make your customers feel that way about your product or service, whatever it is. And he kind of points out here, uh, he says for example, ever bought something from Amazon which squanders its advertising budget on free postage and packaging? Ever wonder why everyone wants an iPod when there are perfectly acceptable alternatives? It is slightly out of date, I guess, as you can kind of guess from those examples. Well, whatever. I mean, they're still relevant today. Here we have Meatball Sunday. Uh, how new marketing is transforming the business world and how to thrive in it. So he basically talks... The idea behind the Meatball Sunday is that a lot of people, when it comes to marketing, they just throw everything together and hope that something sticks. And he kind of points out that... Well, that's like just mixing random ingredients together. That's like making a meatball sundae. It's just not going to taste good. I feel like these... Oh, no, there's lots of those. All right, then we have Permission Marketing. This is basically the book which made Seth Godin's name. So the idea behind Permission Marketing is that people have to opt in to receive, you know, marketing information from you. So this is way before things like GDPR and all the stuff that's happening at the moment. Here we have Poke the Box and... I guess it says when was the last time you did something for the first time I can't remember this one too much it's quite a thin one to be honest uh, yeah it is basically saying you should be the one to, to poke the box I guess you know thinking outside of it and whatnot here we have purple cow transform your business by being remarkable so basically the idea here is that you know we all know what a cow looks like and if you drove past a cow you wouldn't pay it much attention but if you drove past a purple cow you would look at it so the idea is, you know, he shares his theories on how you can turn your business into a purple cow. The kind of thing that's remarkable. Here we have Small is the New Big and 183 other riffs, rants and remarkable business ideas. This is basically like lots of little mini blog posts pulled together. But um, again, Godin's just so incisive in what he says that it's just a pleasure to read him, you know. Here we have Survival is Not Enough, Shift Happens. So again, the idea is that if you want to survive in the business world, merely surviving isn't good enough. You need to constantly be, you know, pushing the envelope or whatever term you want to use. You have to constantly innovate. You can't get complacent and just be happy just to survive. You need to you need to thrive and you need to make that happen. Here we have the big moo. So this is basically a bunch of different people all sharing some of their ideas on how to stop trying to be perfect and start being remarkable. This goes back to, it's kind of a tie-in with purple cow. So obviously a purple cow will make a big moo. And these are ideas on how you can make your company do a big old moo. This is the big red fez, how to make any website better. Now what I will say is that some of Godin's books have aged better than others. So for example here we have like this screenshot and stuff and you're just like wow. Like he's talking about web design and this was accurate when this was published in 2001. But it's no longer really relevant you know. Here we have The Dip. The extraordinary benefits of knowing when to quit and when to stick. The idea here is that when you're setting out to do something you go down this dip where everything goes downhill. And you need to know whether it's going to keep going downhill or whether it's going to dip back up again. So you need to know when to quit and when to stick, when to overcome the dip. Here we have the smiley dictionary, cool things to do with your keyboard. This is a massive gimmick. Don't recommend it. I've only got it because I'm going through all of Godin's books, as you can probably tell. Here we have tribes. We need you to lead us. And the idea here is that in today's society, you know, we all, we all work in tribes now. We all have our own individual tribes. Booktube itself, you could argue, is a tribe. And it needs its leaders, the people who are going to influence that tribe and push it in certain directions, you know? And then it tells you how to be that leader. Then here we have Unleashing the Idea Virus, how to turn your ideas into marketing epidemics. I actually don't remember this one too much, but, you know, you get the picture now, pretty much, of what his books are alike. Here we have V is for Vulnerable, Life Outside the Comfort Zone, and ABC for Grown Ups by Seth Godin. Illustrated by Hugh McLeod. McLeod. Hugh McLeod. I recognise that name. Anyway, and this has got wax on the front of it. Oops. What have we got in here? Ah, remix, reuse, respect, recycle, revisit, reclaim, revere, resorb. Art doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So that's what you can expect from that. Again, a little bit of a gimmicky one, to be honest, but... Then here we have Seth Godin, We Are All Weird. 
And this is basically about what well, it says here, the one size fits all factory oriented world is disappearing so fast we can feel it. So the idea is that people are starting to kind of embrace their weirdness and actually you and your company can kind of feed that weirdness by becoming a part of that weird little community. So yeah, that is it for this week's or whenever. I don't do them weekly, but I do them as often as I can. But that's it for this edition of the Bookshelf Tour. Next time, I believe we're going into Graham Greene, which should be a fun one because he's one of my most read authors. But in the meantime, thanks as always for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments which of these books you've read, if you've read any of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.